All right, I want you to turn your Bibles to Genesis chapter 22. Time has come and is trying to leave us, but we're going to stay here for a little bit. And I'm asking God, as I prayed already, that God would help me as I did this morning, as he did this morning, I should say, to help me to communicate truth to all of us today. You know, brothers and sisters, I say this respectfully, carefully, respectfully to all of us. Everything okay? I say this carefully, respectfully to all of us here. By the way, I got to apologize because, you know, Rashida's in the back. I did it earlier to an Eagles fan, too. Yeah, I had a sister this morning, Tiffany. She was like, hey, pastor, I just turned my nose from her because... <laughs> If you don't know, this is my carnal moment, okay? The Eagles demolished the Giants last night. Uh, security, would you please remove the disturbance in the back? And so that would be Rashida, because I saw her and I shook hands with everybody back there, crossed over, hugged her mother, asked her mother why, but, uh, but Rashida's here ready. I, I don't know if you're here for the Lord or to rub it in, but either way you're here, God has a word for you, okay? <laughs> God has a word for you. Um, but again, I, I just want to say that, as I said this morning, and I want to say it to us here, okay, my, my role here as a pastor is not to make us feel good. My job is to make sure that we're all adhering to the word of God. How many say amen to that, right? As best we know, the Holy Spirit leading us, obviously there are men and women who have studied the book. They've understood Greek and Hebrew. I don't speak Hebrew or Greek, but I do study what they have taught, and so I can just kind of find the words that will just minister to us, because nobody here speaks Hebrew or Greek. Um, so there are different things that obviously we want to extract. And remember, the Word of God is meant to be applied, not just read, but meant to be applied, right? And the Scripture talks about worship for us, and I think for many of us, we've, we've made worship what we've seen on television or what people say worship is, but worship is not people up here putting on a concert so that you can just be entertained, you know that, right? My pastor used to say it all the time. I think he still does. It's a reminder for us that the people are not here to entertain us. If anything, God uses them like a, sometimes we need a jump start. How many know sometimes you just have a rough, day, get, rough time getting to church, right? A rough time on the way. None of y'all have that moment? Okay, you know, uh, come on, don't, don't give yourselves too much away, but you know how you argue all the way here and then you get here. How you doing? Praise the Lord. God is good. <laughs> Yeah, we, we know about that. We know about that, okay? Everybody, everybody has experienced that. But the point is that, you know, um, um, we could just sit back and just clap. That was cute. That's my song. That's my song, you know, because it has to be our song in order for us to get into the worship, right? It has to be, you know, that's the sermon I need to hear today in order to really connect and all that. And don't get me wrong, there are songs that we connect to, there's songs growing up that if I hear today, it just takes me back. Sometimes it shouldn't, but it does, right? There's just songs that do that. But when they're up here, they're up here to just help to usher us into the presence of the Lord. But the truth be told, you should have already, and I should have already entered into the presence of the Lord in terms of like worshiping on the way here, at home, in the car, whether we're walking here, right? So that when we come here, it's like, you know, back in the day, they used to do double dutch or jump rope, right? They didn't start, they didn't, at least they didn't do on my block. You couldn't start in the middle and you got to like jump in. And so that's what it's supposed to be like. When you come ready, when the service starts, you're ready to just jump in and just worship along with everybody else. It can't be a show. But I think what's happened is that we have, we, we were not really cognizant of the fact of what real worship is supposed to be. Real worship. So that's today. Today we're going to talk about real worship. Everybody say real worship. real worship. That's the title of today's message, real worship. You know, we talked some time ago, two weeks ago, we talked about the fact that Jesus in Revelations 2 talking to the church at Ephesus and about how they were busy doing, 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 and everybody was speaking so highly about them, how well they were, and they were known all over the place for doing good works. And Jesus is like, okay, I appreciate your duty, but I'm more interested in your devotion because devotion trumps duty all the time. Because what he wants from us is quality time. And, you know, you've heard me say this before. The way a person spells love is not L-O-V-E, but T-I-M-E. Time is the equivalence to love, okay? So I know you love me, but how much time you spend with me? And that's what the Lord was saying to the church in Ephesus there. Do you love me? But if you love me, then spend time with me. Make it about do devotion, not duty. So we learned that some weeks ago. And then last week, we talked about control, alternate, delete. In other words, change your mind. Change your way of thinking. Why is that? Because if we don't change the way we're thinking, our thinking controls how we feel. 
Proverbs 4 tells us that, you know what, uh, our thoughts have to come under control, if you will. Why? Because they shape the course of our lives. Guard your heart. Guard your thoughts, for it shapes the course of your life. So how we think is usually how we feel, and how we feel is how we respond, how we react. So there are so many relationships that have been destroyed because we felt the person didn't like us. We felt the person had something against us. And as a result of that, we treated them a certain way, and now there's a wall between us and them, or no wall at all because there's no relationship. So we have to be mindful of how we think. And we can think certain things about God. God feels this way about me. I'm, I'm no good in the sight of God because I keep messing up. But how many know the devil is a liar? We know that to be true, right? Because we, as we learned last week, the righteous falls down. But what do they do? They get back up again, right? There's now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. In Christ Jesus. That's the truth of the matter. You know, people say, oh, God is against you. No, God is for me, not against me if I'm in Christ Jesus. So how we think affects how we feel. And that even goes into how we worship God because of how we think or what we think about God or what we think God is doing in our lives could be contrary to what he's actually doing in our lives. And it affects how we worship the Lord, how we live for the Lord. And so we got we to get this right. So Genesis chapter 22, I gave you time to get there. Genesis chapter 22, I want you to look at this. We're going to start at verse 1. If you have it, I want, I want to hear everyone nice and loud say, got it? got it? Come on, if you have it, say, got it? Got it. All right, here's how it reads. Genesis chapter 22, verse 1 says, Sometime later, God tested Abraham. He said to Abraham, he said to him, sorry, he said to him, Abraham, here I am, Abraham replied. Then God said, take your son, your only son, whom you love. Isaac, and go to the region of Moriah. Sacrifice him there as a burnt offering on a mountain. I will show you. Early the next morning, Abraham got up and loaded his donkey. He took with him two of his servants and his son Isaac. And when he had cut enough wood for the burnt offering, he set out for the place God had told him about. On the third day, Abraham looked up and saw the place in the distance. He said to his servant, stay here with the donkey while I and the boy go over there. We will worship. Everybody say worship. worship. We will worship and then we will come back to you. Abraham took the wood for the burnt offering and placed it on his son Isaac, and he carried the fire and the knife. As the two of them went on together, Isaac spoke up and said to his father Abraham, Father? Yes, my son Abraham replied. The fire and the wood are here, Isaac said, but where is the lamb for the burnt offering? Abraham answered, God himself will provide the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. And the two of them went on together. And when they reached the place God had told him about, Abraham built an altar there and arranged the wood on it. He bound his son Isaac and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. Then he reached out his hand and took the knife to slay his son. But the angel of the Lord called out to him from heaven, Abraham, Abraham, here I am, he replied. Do not lay a hand on the boy, he said. Do not do anything to him. Now I know that you fear or reverence God because you have not withheld from me your son, your only son. Abraham looked up, and there in a the thicket he saw a ram caught by his horns. He went over and took the ram and sacrificed it as a burnt offering instead of his son. So Abraham called that place the Lord will provide, or Jehovah Jireh. And to this day it is said, on the mountain of the Lord, it will be provided. Look up here. We all, many of us know that story. We know that story. I like to read, this, I like to read about Abraham's life. Abraham is the father of faith. All the major religions stem from Abraham. All right, so Judaism, Islam, and Christianity. He is the father of faith, obviously, Judaism because of Abraham and because of Ishmael, uh, Islam. But then we have, obviously, Christianity comes out of Judaism. But Abraham is the father of our faith. Here we find Abraham is asked to do something. He's asked to now kill his son. But I want you not to forget or not to miss what it says in Genesis 22, verse 1. Notice on the screen, here we have it. And take pictures of it so you can go home and that you can also study it for yourself. It says, sometime later. Everybody say, sometime later. <coughs> sometime later, God tested Abraham's faith. Sometime later. Well, it's important for us to understand what is that sometime later? What's sometime later? Well, we got to go back to see what this sometime later is. Because what the writer here, Moses, is saying here is that after some things had taken place in Abraham's life, God tested him. So what are those things that we can look at? Well, when we look in Genesis chapter 12, what do we see? We see in Genesis chapter 12, this is when God first spoke to Abraham. A matter of fact, think about this for a second. Abraham was from the Ur of Chaldeans, meaning that he was a pagan, grew up in a pagan society. They believe in many gods, but yet he heard the voice, the distinct voice of the living God, and the living God called him, and guess what? He responded to the living God. 
And as a result of that, God said, hey, here's what I'm going to do for you, Abraham. It was nothing special by Abraham. Abraham didn't do anything. He didn't earn anything to be called. He was just called by God. And God says, hey, I want you to leave your mother, leave your father, leave everybody. I'm going to bless you, make your blessing, and be, because of you, nations will be blessed. Anybody curse you, they're going to be cursed. Boy, that's not a bad deal. Wouldn't you agree? Like, God is with you on that one, right? And so there he is. Now he responds to that. God says, I'm going to make you a blessing. When you, when you read further down, you'll see that how he went down to Egypt, I believe it is. And it was there that he runs into uh, Pharaoh. Uh, but when he goes there, I should say to Egypt, he tells his wife, hey, here's what I want you to do. Because you're so beautiful, tell people you're my sister. Brothers, that's a punk, right? That's what we would say right now, right? <laughs> Imagine, you're so beautiful. Don't, I don't want anybody knowing you're my wife. Because if they know you're my wife, then they're going to probably kill me. It ain't about you, it's about me. Come on now, you got to read the Bible for what it is. Read it, that's what he's saying. It ain't about you, it's about me. So now just tell them that you're my sister. And you know what almost happened? As a result of him getting, trying to get her to lie, for him to lie, his wife was almost sexually assaulted. Thank God God intervened and stopped Pharaoh from doing this. Well, you keep on reading about him, and you see that how he had to go and rescue his nephew named Lot. And just follow me on this, okay? He had to rescue his, his nephew named Lot. Lot, who he was not supposed to take in the first place. Lot brought problems. Lot and him separated. And now Lot finds himself trapped, and now he's in this place, and they're, they're, they kidnapped him. And now here, Abraham has to go with some herdsmen, and they have to go and rescue Lot. Abraham doesn't have fighting men, but he has herdsmen. But you know what Abraham has? He has the hand of God with him. He has God Almighty in his, in his corner, if you will. The favor of God is on his life. I mean, Abraham is, you know, Abraham is really basking, if you will, in the favor and the grace and mercy of God. Well, he goes and he rescues, Abraham. He rescues Lot. Think about that for a second. He rescues Lot with just his herdsmen. We keep reading about his life, and you'll see that there came a moment where a moment of discouragement, and out of nowhere, God says it again. Hey, Abraham, I want you to know that I'm going to bless you and make you a blessing. Abraham's like, how are you going to do this? I have no one. I have no heir. All I have is, uh, I think his name is Eleazar, who's my servant. And God says, no, 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 it won't be through him. Don't worry, through you, I'm going to give you, through your seed, I'm going to bless you. This is what he's hearing from God. And God is encouraging him once again that this is what I'm going to do for you. God keeps on talking to him and being with him and encouraging him. God, as a matter of fact, makes a covenant with Abraham. What's the covenant? God says, okay, here's what I want you to do. I want you to be circumcised and everyone in your family be circumcised. This would be a covenant between me and you that I'm your God and you're my people. A covenant. Circumcision. I need you to experience a little pain, but this will be unlike any other nation. It's like wearing a wedding band. The wedding band says you belong to someone, so this circumcision says that you belong to me because you belong to me. And through it all, God was faithful to bless him, to provide for him. You keep reading about Abraham, and it came a moment where, guess what? Now God speaks to him and Sarah and says, at the appointed time next year, you're going to have that son. That son that he's been waiting 24 years for at this moment, right? Because now he's 99. He's been waiting since he was 75. And now God says, this moment, guess what? Next year you will have a child. But let's not forget what he tried to do in God's stead. Remember God said you would have a child? And what did he do? Hagar became, who was the servant of his wife, Sarah. She now became like the surrogate, if you will. But not just the surrogate, but that she had to lay with him. You know why? Because Sarah became impatient. Sarah looked at herself. She looked at Abraham, said, you ain't going to do nothing. I can't do nothing. Get the, get the young girl. <laughs> That's how it went down. And so what does, what does Abraham do? He goes, oh, that's not a bad idea. Okay, cool. If that's what you want. If that's what you want. And he goes and he does that. And as a result of that, guess what? She ends up having a child named Ishmael. Now, Ishmael is no fault of his own, but Ishmael brought problems. But it was, it's not the child's fault. He didn't ask to be here. They did something outside of the will of God, which reminds us all the time, which reminds me all the time, that when God makes your promise, wait on the promise of God. Because if not, then guess what? We can help bring the promise about, but it won't be a promise. It'll be a burden, not a blessing. And that's what he did here. And so now the child becomes a, the, the situation. I don't want to say the child. I don't like to say that. But the situation became a burden instead of a blessing in the home. But through it all, the, point I'm, the reason why I'm bringing all this up is because despite his, his uh, flaws and his failures, you know what? God was consistently faithful. Because God called, because think about it, he didn't earn the call of God on his life. God just chose him. So even though he might have slipped and he might have fallen, God already saw all that and he still chose him. And so through it all, 
All he sees is the consistency and the consistent faithfulness of our Lord. Right before this chapter, chapter 22 and chapter 21, you read about him having his treaties with these three kings, I believe it is, and it was there that he has his treaty. There's a little piece there. God gives him a land. So again, and, and now Isaac comes. He's on the scene, the child of promise, the child who brings them laughter. And again, I'm going through this quickly, but you got to go back and read it, chapters 12 through 21. And you'll see again, God has just been faithful. And what could happen is when you see God being faithful and doing so many different things for you, we call those the blessings of the Lord. We say, oh, the favor of God is on my life. Look what the Lord is doing in my life. Oh, let me boast on my Lord. Look what he's doing for me. And God says, good, you, you're boasting of me. You say I'm doing good for you. Now it's time to test you. I'm glad you've been boasting on me. I'm glad you're excited about the things that I'm doing that makes you look good. I'm glad for how it's bringing attention to you and how you're feeling good about yourself. I'm glad you're able to say, look what the Lord has done. Because it's exciting, right? You lied and he covered you. <laughs> he blessed you. You got a guy named Mekhezedek. You don't know who he is. No beginning, no end. He comes and he tithes to you. I mean, God, money just dropping in your hands. Just say he tithed to him. But the point is, you're blessed. Favor of God is on your life. And God says, yeah, now it's time to what? Test you. Well, let's be clear about what testing is, everyone, okay? Because what we need to understand and what we need to be reminded of is the fact that God is the one who tests us. He doesn't tempt us. Sometimes what happens is you got people who say that, you know, the devil, the devil is, you know, God is, God is tempting me. No, God does not tempt. God tests, the devil tempts. Here's what it says in James chapter 1. Look what it says, James chapter 1, verse 13. Don't blame God when you are tempted. Hmm, say la, right? That means, like, just pause. Don't blame God when you're tempted. You, know, you ever meet people like that? I didn't say it was you, so don't, don't get you know, touchy with me, okay? I didn't say it was me either. I'm just saying, have you ever met people like that? Whenever something, they say, the devil, the devil, the devil, the devil, the devil's tempting me. Uh, the, 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 you know, I mean, God is tempting me to do this. Uh, you know, it's the devil's fault that I'm doing it. There was a guy back in the day. His name was Flip Wilson. Ever, anyone ever heard of him? I'm just seeing who all the older folks are. Yeah. He's from a long time ago. And he used to always say, the devil made me do it. 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 Really, the devil doesn't make us do anything. The devil can only tempt us. It's us who bite on the bait that he throws our way. But what we are not to do is to blame God. He says, don't blame God when you're tempted. God cannot be tempted by evil. And here's very important. He, he doesn't use evil to tempt others. God doesn't try to get you to fall to see if you're going to mess up. Who does that? A wicked person does that, but that's not the God that we serve. He's not evil like that. When God does, what God does is God tests us. Now, God allows things to happen, but the, the one that comes from God, the thing that comes from God, that's called a testing of the Lord. And here's what it says in James 1, 2. It talks about the fact, consider it pure joy, brothers and brothers, sisters, when you face trials of many kinds, for it's a testing of your faith, and your faith, once it's tested, produces what? Perseverance. So God is always testing us to make us stronger because a faith untested is no faith at all. Meant to build endurance and perseverance in our lives. Here's what it says in James chapter, I'm sorry, 1 Peter chapter 1 verse 7. It says, your faith will be like gold that has been tested in a fire. And these trials will prove that your faith is worth much more than gold that can be destroyed. Notice what it says. And these trials will what? Prove. Come on, everybody. These trials will what? That's right. They will prove your faith. In other words, what God's looking for is genuine faith because it talks about the fact that it's, right before this, it talks about it's tested by fire. It's refined by fire. When I was growing up, we, what we would do is to get some, you know, we would go down to Delancey Street there in Manhattan, and they used to always have these guys, right? They had these coats that were open up, and they had watches, and they had chains, just seeing who's in my age bracket again. Y'all all give yourselves away. And you go down there, and the guy, you say, I want 14 carat. And he say, 14, y'all got it right here, guy right here, 14 carat gold, 14 carat. And then what he would do is hold a lighter. And he would hold the lighter over the, the chain. Why? Because if it drip, it ain't real. Right. right? But the way they would do it is they go like this. They never, they never held it there. They never held it so you could see it melt. They just they, they go like this, right, to go right by it. But that's what God does. God refines us. He allows us to go through the fire. Sometimes he sends the fire to refine us. Why? To prove our faith. 
Because a faith untested is what? No faith at all. And so what do we find here in Genesis chapter uh, 22, verse 1? It says that God tested Abraham's faith. That's what it says here. And how did he do this? Look at verse 2 on the screen. It says this, then God said, take your son, your only son. Everyone read that, that's highlighting yellow. Ready? Whom you love. Isaac, and go to the region of Moriah. Ready? Sacrifice him there as a burnt offering. Who? The one you love. Let's leave that up for a second. So now here comes the testing of his faith. What's the testing of his faith? God says, here's what I want you to do, Abraham. I want you to take the son, your only son, and before you start thinking about the other son, I want to say the one that you love. Because what I want you to do, Abraham, is I want you to sacrifice, I want you to give up the one that you love to me. Because, see, to just give me something that means nothing to you, that, that means nothing to me. So I'm going after your heart, Abraham. I know about Ishmael, but Ishmael is not the one that you love. I know he's your son, but if it came down to it, you're going to go with Isaac over Ishmael. So I'm saying to you, give me the one that you love. And here's what I want you to do. I want you to sacrifice him as a burnt offering. What's a burnt offering? That's an offering that was placed on the altar that was wholly consumed by fire. That was an offering that was committed to the Lord. No part of it was eaten by the priest or the people. Certain offerings the priest would eat and the people would eat called fellowship offerings, meal offerings. But this, the burnt offering, all of it was consumed by fire because it was an offering meant for God, completely for God. That's what the burnt offering was all about. And God says, here's what I want to do. I want to prove, I want you to prove your love for me by giving me the one that you love. Because God knew what was in his heart. God knew what was in his heart. So now before I get to the message, let's just just take a little journey here, if you will, on some of the parallels of Isaac and Abraham with Jesus and and God the Father. Because I think this is just important here. Because what we said is he says, hey, the one whom you love, and this is the first time love is mentioned in the Bible. The first time it's mentioned is about the father's love for a son. And what we know is that God said, hey, take the one that you love, your only son. And again, the the one that you love. We know Jesus was what? The begotten son of God, right? The only son, if you will, the begotten son of God. So we find here the father has now has to sacrifice the son. And here we have God, the father, who's going to sacrifice his son. We see Isaac, we finished reading, was carrying the wood. And we know that Jesus himself would start to carry. We know a man named Simon would come and take it from him. But he himself was also carrying the wood that he would be laid on, if you will. We knew he would be sacrificed as a burnt offering. In other words, wholly consumed as unto the Lord. Behold, John said, the lamb of God who would take away the sin of the world. The lamb used for a burnt offering. That's what we find with Jesus. So you see the parallel between their lives. That's why Isaac is what is called the type of Christ. A type of Christ is anyone that you see in the Old Testament who has some of the characteristics of Jesus in the New Testament. And that's what we find here with Isaac. But what I love here is that we know how the story ends, right? We know that when Abraham went to kill his son, when he went to slay his son, it was there that an angel cried out and said, oh, behold, there's a ram in the thicket. And he saw there was a ram there. And the Bible says this. Here's what the Bible says. The Bible says that he looked over there, and and when he saw it, then he said, on this mountain, this is now what? The mountain of the Lord that we call Jehovah Jireh. Why? Because the Lord provided there. Now, why did I go through all that? Because I think it's important for you to understand how good our God is. God was giving us a preview of what that mountain would really represent. Because see, on that mountain, that mountain of Mount Moriah, guess what? Later on, you would see that David would purchase that land. And that would be the land that Solomon's temple would be built on. That would be the land where they would make sacrifices for years and years and years to come. But it was also that land when you go to Mount Moriah, you go north at the pinnacle there at the top of the hill, some yard, hundreds of yards away from the, where the temple was built, that's a place called Golgotha. We know it as what? Calvary. And how many know on Calvary, on Golgotha, on that hill, 2,000 years ago, there was another lamb that was sacrificed. And that lamb is the lamb of God, and his name is Jesus. Come on, let's put our hands together and thank God for that. Why is that so important? Why is that so important? Because remember, Abraham said the Lord would provide. In other words, the Lord provided a ram so I didn't have to sacrifice my son. The Lord provided a lamb so that you and I could have eternity with him for all all eternity. We could be with him for all eternity. That's good news, brothers and sisters. That is great news. 
That was placed, that's Jehovah Jireh. Because on that, on that hill, on that hill, our Savior died for you and for me. The Lord provided salvation. He provided peace with him so that we could have the peace of him. That we can seek him for healing in our hearts and in our minds and in our bodies. We can seek him for healing in relationships. We can seek him to do the impossible because with man it's impossible. But with God, what? All things are possible. And with him, because he provided for us, all the promises of God are yes and amen in Christ Jesus. One more time, can we put our hands together and thank God for that mountain? That's why I love that song. Singers, if you would help me with that song. There's a song, old song. I, it's, it's, listen, brothers and sisters, I, I, I love the hymns. I hope you love the hymns too, right? And some of the songs that we sing today, 100 years from now, they'll be hymns. But I love the hymns that I know of today. And there's a song that says, On a hill, on a hill far away, away stood an old come on. rugged cross, the, the emblem of suffering. May we never forget the cross of Calvary. Amen. We're only here because of that cross, meaning in right standing with God because of that cross. So while Abraham was excited about the ram that was in the thicket, and he said the Lord provided, may we never forget he is Jehovah Jireh. He is the Lord who provided the way of salvation. Amen? Amen. Because make no mistake about it, and we make no apologies for it. The scripture is clear. There's only one way to the Father, and that way is through Jesus the Christ. There's no all roads lead to heaven. There's a wide road, but then there's a narrow road, and the narrow road is the one that Jesus says that we have to cross over. Now, we read all about that, about the blessings of Abraham, and we see about the testing of Abraham, right? Because it's got to be tested. But let me just tell you what stands out to me as we now get ready to conclude here in this message. What stood out to me is what is said in verse five. Notice in verse five, he said to his servants, stay here with the donkey while I and the boy go over there. Read that nice and loud. We will worship. And then we will come back to you. One more time, we will what? We will worship. And then we will come back to you. So let's just, let's just put ourselves there, okay? Don't just read it like some little story, okay? Put yourself there. Think about this for a second. God tells him to kill your son, and he says, we're going to go worship. Well, what does worship mean? Worthy ship, that's what it means, right? It means to bow down. It means um, 
something that has your affection, something that has your attention and your affection. That's what worth is. When you say it's worthy, it's worthy what? Worthy of my affection, worthy of my attention. And he's saying, listen, the boy and I are going to go over there and worship. And this is the first place you find worship in the Bible. So we talked about love. The first time we find love in the Bible is about the love of a father for his son. And now here we're finding about worship. But what is worship? Because he's saying, we're, you, me and the boy, the boy and I, we're going to go worship. But what did God ask him to do? God God asked him to kill the very thing that he loves. That's worship? Are you trying to be clever? Abraham, are you trying to be funny? No. He understood that what I know what God is asking of me. God is not asking me of something that means nothing to me. God is asking me for the very thing that I treasure the most. And so what he's saying here is, look, do you love me more than you love that? Or do you love that more than you love me? And the only way I'm going to know is kill it. Kill the one that I promised you. Kill the one that you've been waiting for 25 years plus now. Now imagine 25 plus years, kill that one. Kill the one that you, you put all your hopes and your dreams and you banked everything on. Kill that one. Because here's what God is after. God is after the heart. Do you love me more than that or do you love that more than me? And this is the way that I'll know by you killing the very thing I'm asking you to kill. Lay your Isaac on the altar today. Are you all with me? Say amen if you are. I didn't say it was pleasant to hear, but this is what it is, right? Because that's what real worship is. God is like, here, on this mountain, Mount Moriah, here's what I'm asking of you. I want you to give me your best because some years from now, 1,000, 2,000 years later, or whatever case may be, guess what? I'm going to give my best on that mountain. I want everything from you. I don't want little things. I want everything from you. And listen, if it doesn't cost you, then I don't want it. Because that's what real worship is. Worship is not just a song that we sing. It's not just hands being clapped. It's easy to worship when things are going good. It's easy when you lie and God cover for you. It's easy when, you know, when you got the favor of the quote, unquote, the favor of the Lord in your life. It's easy when the promotion comes. It's easy when the doors open up. It's easy when everybody is just wanting to be, have your life. It's easy when you can say your best life now. But will you worship me when it's all gone? Am I still God if you no longer have that? Or do I cease being God because you don't have those things anymore? Do I cease being your God, Abraham, if Isaac is no longer in your life? I want your son, the one whom you love. You know, David understood about when things cost. It says in 2 Samuel, you know, this is when David had numbered the men. He wasn't supposed to do that because all the victories have been God, but he had a little pride, some pride in him, and he began to count the men that they had, the fighting men, because that would give him a sense of how we can take over, not take over, but we can defeat and we can defend, and so based on how many people we have, and he's forgetting, no, David, no, the reason why you're having victory is because God is with you. Right? It's not about how much money you have in the bank. It's not about your higher education. It's not about the job that you have. It's not about who you're connected to in terms of in this world. It's about who, who you're connected to in terms of outside of this world. And that's God and God Almighty. But David got proud. And because he got proud, God says, okay, I'm going to give you three things. You got, here's what you can do. You can plague, sickness, or you know, which, which do you want? And David's David like, look, let me just fall into your hands. Well, don't let me fall into the hands of men. That's a powerful message right there. All right? I don't want to fall into the hands of man. I want to fall into your hands, God, because I know you're merciful. And so the Lord sends an angel, and the angel comes. And it's a powerful past scripture. Probably preach for Easter. It's an Easter message. And so the angel comes, and the angel's destroying the people in the land. And then finally, it wasn't even David. It wasn't even David who, who, who said stop. It was the Lord who saw the angel killing the people, and the Lord said, Enough! You got to read it, 2 Samuel 22. The Lord said, Enough to the angel, because why? Because God loves his people. It broke his heart that he had to discipline them, but he had to do this. Well, guess what? Now someone named Gad tells David, David, David's like, I need something. I need to be able to, I want to you know, build an altar. I want to give to the Lord. And so he sends him to this guy named Aruna's house. Aruna, uh, Aruna, Aruna, I think how you pronounce it. And he sends him to his house to go purchase some things. And this guy Aruna is like, listen, King David, here, just take it all because you're the king. So just take it all. The Lord is with you. Just take it all. And here's what we pick up in verse 23. He says this, take them, is what Aruna says. They're yours. I hope the Lord your God will be pleased with you. But David answered, no. No, I have to pay you what they're worth. Musicians, if you agree, come. 
I have to pay you what they're worth. I can't offer the Lord my God a sacrifice that costs me nothing. So David bought the threshing place in the oxen for 50 pieces of silver. But read that what's highlighted in yellow with me. Ready? I can't offer the Lord my God a sacrifice that costs me nothing. Why? Because he's worthy of it all. It's not a song that we sing. You see, when, when we come to worship the Lord, we don't give God a, a half. We don't give God a portion. We're called to give God our all. When we sing, we sing with everything that's within us. When we clap, we clap with everything that's within us. When these men play, they play with everything that's within us. When he's on that camera, he's focusing that camera with everything that's within him. When they're doing sound, when they're doing PowerPoint, when I'm up here preaching, someone's praying, we do it with everything that's within us. We do it through pain, we do it through suffering, we do it, we do it through loss. Why? Because he's still worthy of it all. And that's what he said. He said, listen, when you come to worship, worship costs. It's not, it's not a game. It's not a dance. It's not a ceremony. It's a lifestyle. And don't get me wrong. This is a struggle for all of us in here. Here's what he says in Romans chapter 12, verse 1. Paul writes this. He says, therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, just like Abraham, some time later, in view of all that God has done, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. Notice what he says. Read it. Ready? This is your true and proper worship. This is your true and what? Proper worship. Why is that? Because everything we do, we do through our bodies. We look at things through our bodies. We hear things through our bodies, right? We do things with our hands through our bodies. We walk to places with our bodies. So wherever we find ourselves, we're supposed to present our bodies as a living sacrifice, a burnt offering, wholly consumed. It's not a portion of me that belongs to God. All of me belongs to God. Jesus said, love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. You know what that is? That's everything. So worship is a lifestyle. And it costs, and it hurts. You want to be and do and go and feel and be around. And God says, do you love the, do you love that more than you love me? Your song is cute, but your life is better. The playing is nice. The focus is doing good. That's good, but your life is better. That matters more, most to me true and proper worship. See, worship requires, as I'm speaking to myself here, obedience. Because that's what this was all about. Abraham didn't question God. He, you, you, you peeped that, right? You, you read that with me, right? God called him. He said, his words are, here I am. He didn't, God said, kill. He didn't say, you sure about that? He didn't do, here, see how old you are. He didn't say, what are you talking about, Willis? <laughs> right? He, he didn't do that either. He was like, all right, okay. It's what you want. I got to do what you say. Worship is about obedience. See, there was no Jehovah Jireh until obedience was taking place. And see, and that's where we get it twisted. That's where we get it wrong. We all get it wrong at times. We want God to be Jehovah Jireh apart from obedience. It doesn't work that way. I don't care who preaches what to you. It doesn't, that's not how God flows. The blessing follows obedience. So as he has the knife up and he's ready to kill, then all of a sudden, guess what? Then the ram comes because Jehovah Jireh, the Lord provided when he was doing what it is that God told him to do. Are you all with me? Just say amen if you are. So it's not about a song. It's about surrendering. Real worship is love, trust, and obedience. Now, I want you to take yourself to that moment, okay? Because the Bible says that for three days, they traveled. Remember, three days, Jesus was in the tomb, and then he rose, right? And I'm going to get to that in a little bit. I forget, I forgot to say that this morning. But for three days, they traveled. Because here's the deal, right? You can't think, and I can't think for those three days, Abraham was like, God told me to kill. I'm going to do what God told me to do. I'm just going to, you know, I'm just going to obey God. That's it. I'm good. I'm good. Whatever God says, I'm going to do. Come on. That's his son. Like, I, I, I hear you, God. I know what you told me to do. 
can you imagine the first night? Because it took three days. So can you imagine the first night? They're, you know, they're camping, whatever, they're looking, they got the guys with them. He looks and he sees his son just sleeping. And now mind you, that this is very important. Isaac was not like some toddler. Maybe you've seen this in pictures. He wasn't a toddler. Uh, Josephus, I, I remember reading this some years ago. He said he was maybe about 25. Others have him older. I don't know. Josephus, which is the, uh, the Jewish historian, you know, uh, he said he was about 25. Some people have him older. So he wasn't like some little punk kid. His father was 100 plus years old. So if he's, a, if he's 25, that means his dad's 125. You're telling me he can't take him? Let that sink in for a moment there. But no, the Bible says that he willingly laid himself down. The same way Jesus willingly laid himself down. Jesus said, no man takes my life, I what? Willingly lay it down. And so we have Isaac doing the same thing. But can you imagine, right, as he's looking at his boy, his pride and joy, the boy that he waited for, the boy 25 years he waited for, the boy that he almost messed up on getting because he slipped and did something he shouldn't do, and he looked over at him, and all he could think is God said, kill him. I imagine the first night he looked up to heaven. The same God who said, look at the stars, so shall be your descendant. He's looking at his boy saying, God, are you sure? This one here? This is who you want me to kill? And maybe as he looked at the stars, it reminded him of something of God. And maybe he got through it that night because you know how it is. You know, God speaks to us about something. Kill it. Let it go. Release it. Don't get involved. And then, you know, we, then we feel like we can't. But then God speaks a word or someone says something. We get a little bit more courage and strength. And we're able to just go another day. So second night comes. He looks again. He sees this boy. But he knows they're only a day's journey away to doing what God told him to do. God, are you sure? this one here the third one that night I should say two nights three days he goes he sees him he's like God and don't listen come on that's the way it is when we come into worship the Lord when we gather together we got we got things we're thinking about we want to give him our all but we're like God are you sure that man says he loves me that woman says she loves me no one in my family has a job like I have the job. You want me to leave that job? You want me to leave that group of influential people? Don't you understand, God? They're the next step to what it is that I want to do. Kill it. But I'm comfortable. Kill the comfort. You want me to leave this state to go to that state to do that ministry? You want me to leave this country to go to that country? You, you want me to do what, God? Are you sure? Kill it. And that wouldn't be so strange, right? We could look at Abraham and go, oh, man, Abraham, boy, he was getting weak, huh? Yeah, but guess what? Jesus did the same thing. In the Garden of Gethsemane, it was there that he knew what he had to do. He knew what the Father was asking of him. And do you know what he said? God, if it's you, he says, Lord, if, it, if Father, if it can be so, let this cup pass. Come on, I don't, I, in, my, in, my, in my humanity, I don't want to do this. But, I, but not my will, your will be done. Three times he went, Lord, are you sure about this, Father? Because I don't really want to do this, but not my will, but your will be done. What was happening? There's a struggle there to do what it is that God's called you to do. Because true worship, real worship is obedience. And so I can see Abraham looking and saying, God, are you sure? As a father, I didn't even tell Sarah about this. She wouldn't let me get away with this. How am I going to come back without this boy? But he understood. I got to be obedient. Because that's what worship is. Worship is not, I'm going to say it again. It's not the song that we sing. Nobody, I think, loves worship music more than Tyrone. See, I'm crazy. I'm talking in third person. Nobody loves worship music more than me. Right? But that's not worship. It's music that reminds us. I surrender all, all to thee, my blessed Savior. I surrender all. Right? Worthy, worthy is the Lamb. It reminds me, He's worthy. He is my worship, all of my worship, and I will not be silent. What does that do? It's reminding me, hey, it's not about me, it's about Him. But the singing of the song is not the worship. The worship is the obedience of my life. So as He looked over there, 
I'm sure he was like, God, are you sure? At least that's what I was thinking. But then you got to keep reading your Bible because, you know, Scripture interprets Scripture. And so I, I realized what he was thinking because it wasn't, he wasn't thinking like I was thinking. He wasn't thinking like I was thinking about my three children if it was me and God had asked me to do it. No, no, no. First of all, we wouldn't have gotten there. <laughs> all right? Y'all would not be reading about me in this story, okay? I'll tell you right now. Y'all would have read he got struck down because he didn't listen to Jesus. He didn't listen to God. But, but I want you to know what Abraham was doing. Abraham was doing something that was helping him to be renewed, to worship day by day. Here's what it says in Hebrews chapter 11. Look what it says, Hebrews chapter 11. It says, by faith, Abraham, when God tested him, offered Isaac as a sacrifice. He who had embraced the promises was about to sacrifice his one and only son. He embraced the promises. Remember the promise. Really, it was one promise, but it came through that one child. But he embraced the promises, right? Because uh, there were several promises through the one promise about to sacrifice his one and only son. Even though God has said to him, it is through Isaac that your offspring will be reckoned. Abraham reasoned that God could even raise the dead. And so in a matter of speaking, he did receive Isaac back from death. Why is that so important? Let me tell you why that's so important. Because the whole time I'm thinking he's looking like, God, are you sure? God, are you sure? And maybe there was moments of that. But you know what he kept saying? God, are you sure? But even so, Lord, not my will, your will be done. Because somehow you're going to raise that boy back to life. I've never seen a resurrection before. Nowhere in scripture has anyone been resurrected before. There was no resurrection before this time. We know nothing about a resurrection. Abraham doesn't know about a resurrection. He just knows about a God who made a promise, who keeps his promise. And if God said, through this boy, my offspring is going to come, it must mean that God, when I kill him, you're going to raise him back to life. Because that's the only way it's going to happen. Because you're not going to go back on your word. You're not going to go back on your word. There's no way. You're a God who speaks, and it must be. So if you said through him will be my offspring, you didn't say through Ishmael. You had me send him away. There was nobody else. It's got to be him. So every night he says, I don't know how you're going to do it, but you're going to do it. Now, how you going to do it? I don't know how you're going to do it, but you're going to do it, God. I don't know why I'm going to leave this job to take another job that really I don't, because I, God, I know I'm not happy here, but this pays the bills. So I don't know how you're going to pay the bills with the other job, but I know you're telling me to leave this job to go to this job. It's not about I'm unhappy on this job. It's just that you're telling me to leave this job because you have an assignment for me on another job. I don't know how you're going to do it, but you're going to do it. I don't know, God, about this next step because I'm, I'm fearful, I'm afraid, but I know what you're saying. You're saying, kill that, leave that, do this. Okay, God, I don't know how you're going to do it, but you're going to do it. Why? Because you are Jehovah Jireh when I obey. So I'm going to obey because I need you to be Jehovah Jireh. I need you to be Jehovah Jireh. And my obedience is an act of worship. You're not looking down saying, look at them sing. Many times you're looking down from Isaiah 1 and you're saying, why are they singing? That's not what I want. In Isaiah 1, he says, your feasts have become like a burden to me. Why? Because it's disobedience, just singing, but no, no obedience. Not Abraham. Abraham was like, all the promises were supposed to come through him. So God, you're going to raise him up. So think about this for a second. The whole time, those three days, those two nights, three days, guess what Isaac was? He was dead to Abraham. All he saw was a dead boy. And all he could think about was the fact that this boy, that dead boy, somehow was going to be resurrected. So what am I saying to you? Am I saying to you when you stand over your Isaac today, whatever that may be, or whomever it may be, or whomever they may be, am I saying to you when you stand over it that, you're going to, that when you go to kill it, God's going to say, uh-uh, don't worry, you can keep him. You can keep her. You can keep the job. You can keep the dream. No, I'm not saying that to you. You may keep going and listening, God, 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 God. You're like, <laughs> right? Like, like, God, you, you sure? Like, stop me, Lord. I remember doing that when I was a police officer, when I was resigning or retiring. And I put in my retirement papers. I was like, oh, are you sure? Ministry? I can minister to the bad people. I lock them up, tell them don't do it again. Because that was what I wanted, not what he called me to do. See, what God gives you, he's not going to tell you. He's not going to have you kill that. What he's going to kill is the thing that you want that's not part of his will. This is why he said, your son, whom you love. 
Let me tell you how this ends, and we're completely done. Look on the screen. The angel of the Lord called Abraham from heaven a second time and said, I swear by myself, declares the Lord, that because you have done this and have not withheld your son. Think about that. He said, I swear by my what? By myself. I love that right there because who, who can he swear by? When you go to court, what do you say? I, I, I swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, nothing but the whole truth, so help me God. God goes to court and says, I swear to tell the whole truth, nothing but the whole truth, so help me me. That's what he says in Hebrew. And there was no one hired to swear by, I swore by myself. And he's talking about this here. He says, declares the Lord, that because you have done this and have not withheld your son, your only son, I will bless you. Did you miss that? Because I think you missed that. That because you have not done, because you have done this and have not withheld your son, your only son, I will surely bless you. Let me just read it one more time. Because you have done this and have not withheld your son, your only son, we don't read the part about where he says, the one whom you love. Because why? He demonstrated that his love was greater for God than for his son. When God said to him, now, take it off for a second. When God said to him, now, I know you love me, it wasn't because God is not omniscient and doesn't know all things. It's like when someone does something for you and you go, oh, man, now I know you love me. Because you knew, but now it's like you, you just demonstrated. And that's what Abraham did. He demonstrated his love for God. Now that you didn't withhold from me that which I've asked of you, your son. You didn't withhold, really, your love for me. That's what he's saying there. Jesus says, unless you love, unless you hate mother and father, you know, you have no part in my kingdom. What is he saying? Not to hate them like we hate. He said, they have to be a far distant second to me. Nobody can be close to me. I have to be first and foremost is what the Lord is saying. And that's what's happened here. So as we go back to that verse, notice what he said there. I will surely bless you and make your descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky and as the sand on the seashore. The two things he promised me brought it back up. He said, and your descendants will take possession of the cities of the enemies and through your offspring all nations of earth will be blessed. Think about that. Possession, receiving, giving, favor. Why? Everyone read that. Because you have obeyed me. And I love this part here. I had to add this. Then Abraham returned to his servants. Why did I have to add that? Because remember what Abraham said? Just stay right here, guys, because me and the boy, we're going to come right back. And so when he came back, said, told you, told you. So I'm saying to you today, what is that? What is the Lord asking you to kill? Because that's the act of worship that he wants from you. Grateful that you came to the house of the Lord. I'm grateful. I love to see all of you. you kidding me? I love this. But no, 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 no. It's not about me. It's not about the person next to you. It's about the one who created you. What is the Lord asking you to kill today? What Isaac is he asking you to lay on the altar as a form of worship? I can tell you right now, it's you. It's me. That we would be a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto the Lord, for this is our proper act of worship. Are you all with me? Just say amen if you are. Will you bow your heads and close your eyes? He must be our true worship. He must be our true love in order for there to be real worship. Father, today I thank you for well, this reminder to me that worship is not words. It's not even about works, God. It's about our hearts. This is why you said, Jesus, those that worship the Father will worship him in spirit and in truth. It's not about a location. The woman at the well was caught up with a location, but it wasn't about a location. It was about the heart. So my prayer for all of us, Lord God, in this season of renewal, as we always start the year off with messages like this to remind us to stay focused, to keep the main thing the main thing, that God, we would have a sense of what real worship is to you. Love spoke about the Father and the Son, first word, first time it's mentioned. Worship speaks about killing that which we love that's outside of you. We want you, Jesus, to take the position that you rightfully deserve, and that is that you would take your seat on the throne of our hearts. Any and everything, Lord, that has taken, that has tried to take your place, Lord, we pray that it would be smashed, demolished, Lord, because it benefits us not. It doesn't benefit us at all. As a matter of fact, it brings more problems, more troubles, more delays in terms of the blessings of God on our lives. So, Lord, as I stand before your people, like Moses who interceded on behalf of the nation, God, I'm, I'm interceding on my behalf and on their behalf, Lord. And I'm saying, God, continue to help us to have a heart of worship. Continue to help us to 
evaluate the things and the people in our lives, God. And if there's anything that does not belong, God, we pray by your spirit that we will be able, Lord, to kill it. It sounds harsh, it sounds cold, but that's what has to happen. Why? So that all the promises you've made will continue to flow and be done in our lives, Lord. We don't want anything to hinder, to stop it up, Lord. We don't want there to be a, a stoppage, like a traffic jam. We don't want any, Lord, rubbernecking. No, God, we want there to be a flow of the blessings of God in our lives. So, Lord, when we come together, whether in this place or in our cars, in our homes, Lord, again, Lord, we want to put everything to the side. We want to make sure, Lord, that in everything we're saying, you are first. What we see, what we hear, all that we do, Lord, you are first because you are worthy to be praised. We commit our hearts and our minds to you afresh. And it's in Jesus' name that we pray. And let us all say amen. 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 Did you get anything out of today? Amen. <laughs> Praise the Lord. So what I want to make mention, I, I forgot to mention it this morning, and that is this. Even though we're not having all-night prayer this um, Friday, as Pastor Adrian may mention, please come out Tuesday for prayer meeting. Hey, you know what? One day, can, can, it'd be nice to see all of you at prayer meeting, you know? Both services that we have to put chairs outside. I mean, come on. I want to see you for prayer meeting one day. All right? So make time. We have child care. But the other thing is, um, the other thing is that what we're going to do is on Sunday, when you come in on Sunday, don't be alarmed. We're going to be worshiping, Okay? Next Sunday will be prayer Sunday. We're just going to pray. We're going to pray through those who can pray through. So, again, when you come in, it won't be like everyone stand. We're going to already be worshiping the Lord, okay? So I want you to, to be a part of that next Sunday. That's what we're going to do next Sunday in lieu of all night prayer. God bless you. Have a great afternoon. God bless you. Hey, God bless you. Have a great afternoon. Can I get a God bless you back? All right. Thank you. <laughs> God bless. Our business is glad to have you here.